right, looks like we are on the verge of live. That's a good thing. Melissa, were you good on your end? I'm going to take that as a yes. All right. It's hard to, I think I see some other attendees. So we're going to go ahead and jump in. Welcome, everyone, to Denison University's Red Frame Lab Online. My name is Rick Copeland, and I am the entrepreneur coach at Denison University. This is the first broadcast in a series sponsored by Denison's Remix Entrepreneurs Conference. Today's session is what leaders need to know about the CARES Act and payroll protection. Our intent during this time of upheaval and uncertainty is to ask the question, what does this make possible, rather than to dwell on how difficult it is on so many fronts right now. Let me explain a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Everyone is joined muted, and please make sure that you're muted on your end as well. We're going to be hearing from our guest, GBQ Managing Partner, Darcy Congrove, for the first 40 minutes, and then open it up to your questions. For those on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen via chat and ask Darcy questions. You can ask throughout the presentation, and we'll get to your questions as we can. And Darcy is going to answer as many questions as possible. We're recording this and we'll make it available to everyone on Denison's YouTube channel. Darcy will be providing her contact information should you need to know more after this webinar is over. GBQ has phenomenal resources available for you. If you go to gbq.com slash coronavirus, you're going to see what I mean by phenomenal. I'm going to turn the mic over to Renee Tyak. She's Vice President of Capital Plus in Columbus, Ohio. Renee is a 1998 grad of Denison University who majored in French studies and minored in economics. Renee, welcome to Reimagine Online. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Remix was a great ex experience for me and anything I can do to support that, I'm happy to help. Um, I think at this point, we'd like our participants to um, just say hello by typing in where you're coming to us from, where you're at, and then we'll be happy to welcome you to the program here. Now, Melissa, will you see that? I should see that. I okay. don't see anything yet. Okay, all right. Well, then I guess we'll move ahead. And I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Darcy Congrove, our managing director, the managing director of GBQ. She's been with GBQ since 1998. You can see the full bio. I think we'll make that available, but I know it's also available on GBQ's website. Um, and as the managing director, Darcy's responsible for guiding the overall strategy and operations of the firm. Um, please feel free to visit GBQ's website. There are a ton of resources there, as well as Darcy's full bio. Um, our goal today, thank you, Darcy, so much for being here and joining us. Our goal is really threefold. Our first objective is to provide clarity. There's been so much information, and it's all rapidly changing. Um, so our, our priority number one is to, to provide clarity in this world of uncertainty. Um, second objective is to help you reposition uh, and, and restructure so that you're well positioned to innovate and accelerate through this. Uh, and then the last is to ask the question, you know, what does this make possible? What can we do from here? So with that, I welcome Darcy Congrove. Thank you so much for joining us and I will pass the mic to you. Thanks, Renee, um, and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we know this is a really challenging time, and we know that you're making a lot of challenging decisions in your business and probably need advice from a lot of different directions at this point. Uh, everything has happened so rapidly that it's been hard to keep up um, from the shutdowns to the volume of legislation that has come our way. Uh, everything's happening at a very quick pace. The rules are often changing every day even on the things that have already been issued. And so there's a lot to keep up with. So 
Uh, let me give you just a little bit of background about GBQ and my role there, which I think will help give you the perspective that I'm coming from so that we can find a way to connect on uh, how our perspectives overlap. Uh, we are a 220 person accounting firm. We're based in Columbus. We have offices in Indianapolis, Cincinnati, and Toledo. We represent primarily closely held businesses. Those range in size from businesses that are pre-revenue IT startups, uh, some of the incubators at Ohio State feed us clients that way. And then also uh, some of the largest multi-generational family owned businesses uh, in the state that are names that you would recognize. So we see a huge variety of clients and what we know right now is that this recession is unusual, very different than certainly the last one that we lived through in 08 and 09 because it's landing on businesses in a very different way depending on what your business is. So the issue of being shut down or not or um, being essential or not is, is very significant. And for that reason, um, the legislation has been directed to try to hit those places uh, that need it most, but in some cases it's missed a little bit. So what we wanna do today is give you um, a collection of information that GBQ has put together on all of the things that have happened so far. Um, in some cases, we're gonna go through it quickly because it's not the primary focus of today's session, uh, but we'll be able to share the slides with you. And we've got, I think, a thorough enough information on the slides to give you some guidance um, that you can take on your own or we can answer questions for you later. We're gonna spend most of our time today talking about uh, the CARES Act and the Payroll Protection Program. And then um, some, at the end, some lessons that we've learned in our business uh, that we have shared with our clients just this week. And we hope that maybe those are lessons that will be valuable to you as you try to figure out the next steps in your business. Um, we're finding that we are learning things uh, rapidly as we go that have nothing to do really with legislation or the current situation. They're ha they have a lot to do with how we're reacting as humans and how we're figuring out how to do things differently than we've, we've ever done them before. So we have started at the firm, uh, started about, let's say, I think it was March 4th that our first email to all associates went out about the coronavirus. And that one simply said, stay home if you're sick and wash your hands. And if you look at that timeline and think about what's happened now in six weeks, uh, today, April 15th is tax day. It's a weird tax day because there are no taxes due today for the first time in my 27 years. So I'm hoping that I can maybe take this year off my tally of 27 and just hold tight for next year. Um, those, those tax seasons are kind of like dog years, they age you. So we have, we, from the beginning of March, we really started with kind of three basic principles. Um, the first was that we need to build trust with our employees. And that frankly started with trying to make people understand that this was a real thing and that we were gonna have to respond to it. Um, obviously we've moved way past that at this point. Uh, we're trying really hard to just be completely honest with people. Um, if you've watched any of Governor DeWine's and Dr. Acton's press conferences in Ohio, you know that one of the things they say over and over again is we're gonna tell you what we know when we know it, because when we all have good information, we can make good decisions. And so we've been trying to follow um, that. We're also trying to address along the way, not just how are we working remotely, we are all 100% working from our homes right now, um, but how are we interacting with our clients and how are all of these issues of impacting people's personal lives and what do we need, we need to do to support our associates. Um, we assume that if we take care of our employees that they will do the next thing on the slide, right? Which is focusing on the customers. And so when our employees are in a good spot, they take good care of our clients and client service right now is pretty intense because we have people that are very concerned about uh, the future of their business and the future of their livelihoods. So. Um, we need everybody to be in a good spot to be able to do that and, and to also be able to pull back from some of the details of all these rules and action steps and try to look at the bigger picture and figure out what's the plan out of this. Uh, I think particularly in the last week, we've started working on you know, plans for recovery with people and helping them figure out what's gonna be next as opposed to what's crisis management look like entirely. Um, and then the last thing is trying to figure out how we take care of our business at the same time that we're taking care of everybody else. And I think everybody with customers and clients understands that you've got to focus on your customer first, but you've also got something, you know, that you've got to do in your own business to make sure that you're giving critical attention to that and working on your own recovery plan. So we're kind of focused on everything from those perspectives. Um, when we keep that in the right order, it seems to be working. Sometimes it gets a little out of whack and we have to 
intentionally reorder it. So today, um, there's a lot of things on this agenda. And as I said, this is a jam packed slide deck. We will not talk about all of it. Um, the first thing I thought we ought to do is talk through kind of what are the stimulus actions that have happened so far. Uh, we can talk about the SBA loans, the various pieces of legislation, and then the particular things that I think people are probably tuned in and most interested in, which I, in our experience to date has been primarily in the CARES Act. It's in the Paycheck Protection Program loans and also in some of the tax provisions that are in the CARES Act. So I think it's useful to start with trying to figure out how to, you know, kind of what has happened. Um, there's news that's kind of overflowing right now, but what Congress has done uh, at the federal level is really in three phases. The first phase um, was simply to put $8.3 billion, if that can be simple, it's a, it's a huge number, into the already existing emergency injury disaster loan program. So that's the program that has existed at the SBA for a long time. And that's the program that funded uh, Hurricane Katrina recovery as an example. And anytime there's a natural disaster, these are the places where businesses go to try to get funding to help them recover from the disaster. So that was just additional funding to that program. Um, there was also a lot of appropriations done in that phase one that went to the healthcare systems and to local governments and so forth. But in terms of client facing things, it would be um, expanding that emergency disaster loan program. The second phase was the phase, the Family First uh, Coronavirus Relief Act, which actually created um, paid leave for people who are impacted by of uh, being sick from the coronavirus or for people who are caring for children who no longer had daycare or caring for others in their families who were sick. And so this enforced paid leave across all businesses with between 50 and 500 employees. It also provides, it's a complicated act. And this is one where the Department of Labor and the IRS both kind of have pieces of this because there are tax credits that offset the cost of the paid leave for employers and the IRS and the DOL have both been issuing their own guidance on this as things have been uh, rolling forward here. So for the last couple of weeks, we've gotten an update on this act that changes or clarifies something almost every day. Um, the third phase, which is much more significant financially, is $2.2 trillion uh, in the CARES Act. And the CARES Act it has funding for, again, healthcare and other you know, critical government functions but it also has um, money that is available and they're sorting it out right now, either via grant or loan uh, to bail out the airlines and other critical businesses. It's, it's got um, funding for $349 or $349 billion uh, in this paycheck protection program, which are forgivable loans via the SBA. And then it's got a lot of tax provisions. Most of the tax provisions are actually things that were taken away in the 2017 Tax Act that happened around Christmas time that became effective in 18. There were a number of, quote, loopholes that were closed at that point and some favorable to tax provisions uh, that were rolled back in that act. And in the CARES Act, we see a number of those coming back into play for a temporary time frame. So that's the kind of the landscape of what has happened. Um, there's a lot of rumor right now about what phase four is going to look like. And before we close out today, we can talk about that a little bit. So um, beyond all of that, outside of congressional action, uh, the Federal Reserve last week uh, added another $2.3 trillion to the economy, primarily by doing what the Federal Reserve does all the time, which is backing up the credit of the existing financial institutions and that entire credit system to make more capital available for households and businesses. But they've also established a new loan program through the Fed, uh, which is called the Main Street Lending Program. This picks up where the PPP leaves off and actually starts with um, companies that, or goes up to companies that have uh, 10,000 workers and less than 2.5 billion in revenue. So in the CARES Act, um, the big chunk that was allocated to businesses like airlines uh, really was focused on the major, major companies in the country. And then the Paycheck Protection Act was focused on the kind of small to medium business. This Main Street Lending Program fills in that gap. Uh, there are very few details available right now for this program. 
There is no limitation that if you've got a Paycheck Protection Program Act that you cannot qualify for this Main Street program too. These are not forgivable loans. These are just very favorable terms on four-year loans through the SBA. So uh, how's all this working so far? Well, it depends on what business you're in. Um, as I said earlier, the last recession and this one are very different because we can see even in our client base that some of our biggest clients who have been deemed to be essential are really moving forward business as usual. But those same size clients uh, who are non-essential have laid off hundreds and hundreds of workers. And I'm sure that you've all seen the unemployment statistics, which are astonishing right now. Uh, we also represent a lot halt in most cases. Uh, pizza and carry out is a little bit of the exception if that was your core business in the first place. It's been very hard for, for restaurants who were not carry out restaurants uh, primarily to make that shift and make any money out of that. But um, we know that they're all trying. So it kind of depends on where you are. Um, the government haste to bring all of this to market um, was absolutely necessary based on what was going on with the unemployment claims and how businesses were suffering. Um, but it's lacking details in a lot of places, as I've mentioned already, and so that's been challenging. I think there are a number of times that we have given advice on a webinar and literally like three days later had to do a different webinar to change that advice. So that's obviously very confusing for business owners who are also managing a lot of things inside their business that are confusing and, and urgent. Uh, systems are just simply not built. Major systems in our government are not built to move quickly. Uh, so one of the things that's been in the pop popular press is the issue of state unemployment systems and how some of those are still built in 50-year-old COBOL code. And so taking the uh, new initiatives that the federal government has added to state unemployment and trying to get those websites up to speed so that people can actually benefit from those provisions has been really challenging. Um, they're trying to find the guys out there who were the original COBOL people that are probably in their early 70s at this point and see if any of them will come back and help. And that's that's literally true. So things are, are a little different. Um, we also, in the last recession, saw significant pressure on the banking system. And there was a ton of regulation then that came out after 2009 uh, related to regulatory restraints on banks. Um, some of those fly in the face of what the banks are being asked to do right now in order to get money into the system quickly and get money out to businesses. So the banks have really been challenged. I know that our, our bank that we're using for the firm is currently working three shifts. So it's been a really challenging time. So we definitely have clients who have received the loans and who have been funded and who are making plans. We have a lot of clients that are in the queue and have had loans approved but have not yet gotten the money. Um, we have clients who are taking advantage of a number of the tax deferral provisions that we're going to talk about soon. So there are absolutely places where these things are making a big difference. We're just seeing that it's landing in different places for different businesses. And in particular, I think with the paycheck protection, if you're not able to bring your workers back uh, within an eight-week window, you're really not going to be able to take advantage of the forgiveness provisions in that loan. And that really encompasses most of the restaurant and hospitality business are not confident that in eight weeks they will be able to restore their payroll because the initiative on the forgiveness is to uh, keep your people paid. So we would say there that um, more action is needed. So the first, this is the first thing that I talked about phase one, uh, the economic injury. I spend a lot of time here because honestly they run out of money. So there was 8.3 billion that was put into this. Uh, they, they have received 383 billion in loan requests to date from small businesses. So right now, um, just two days ago, the SBA said that the maximum loan they would be making under these provisions is $15,000 per business. It previously had a $2 million cap. So these are um, affordable interest rates and, and good term loans. These are underwritten by the SBA and you apply directly to them to get them. Uh, at this point, the $15,000 may not be worth the hassle. Um, it depends kind of on what your situation is. Um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, I'm just gonna hit this quickly and I'm gonna leave these details for you all to dive into if you need them. Uh, there's two pieces to this. There's a required paid sick leave, which can relate to the employee's sickness or the sickness of others that the employee is taking care of. And then there's also expanded FMLA provisions. Um, 
It applies to you if you have more than 50 or less than 500 employees. And if your employee has worked for you for 30 days and you're not a health, in the healthcare business or an emergency responder, uh, there's a, the exception for small businesses is under 50. And it basically requires a small business to say that it would be a hardship to implement it, which we're seeing is, is pretty much a given at this point. So I'm gonna click past the details on this. I'm just gonna demonstrate to you here that they're here for you. Um, the piece of the paid leave, so the, the government is not paying the paid leave directly. The government is, is mandating that employers will pay it, but the government then is offering uh, tax credits against payroll taxes that will be um, available as you submit your, your biweekly or monthly or whatever payroll it is that you're doing you can take the money back that you're paying for paid leave against those payroll taxes that you're submitting so that effectively it is being funded uh, for you. So those tax credits are available to everybody that's doing it. There's a lot of rules. There's a lot of caps and timelines and things that apply to this paid leave and to the credits. And so if you are in a situation where you have are in that size range and you've got people who are sick that are asking for leave, um, we're certainly happy to talk to you in more detail about that situation because there's a lot here and a lot of it crosses over from the things that accountants do. We are finding that there are really thousands of nuanced situations. So um, we'll move on from there. I should go back here just for a second. If you are in that size range, uh, there are a couple of employer actions that are required. You need to create some sort of plan um, to be able to take these requests and respond to them in a timely fashion. You need to have at least a temporary amendment to your handbook or your policies to account for this. And you need to post the Department of Labor Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. And if you're working remotely and you don't have a place to post that, like you post your other DOL posters, um, it's perfectly acceptable for you to email that to all of your associates or to put it on your intranet where they can find it. But you're required to do some communication with your employees to let them know that this is available. All of those resources, including the required poster, are on the GBQ website. A couple other little things have happened. Uh, I joked about this at the outset. The tax filing deadline, which is normally April 15th, is the, the date that all tax accountants' lives revolve around, uh, has been moved to July 15th. Uh, we have mixed feelings about that. That's certainly a relief for our clients on payments. Um, we're not sure that we like the idea of a seven-month-long tax season. Uh, but um, the, this covers all kinds of things. So it is filing the returns for individuals, trust estates, anything that was due on April 15th, basically it was gift tax returns. It also includes an extension of time to pay. So the time to pay your taxes, um, any balance that was due for 2019, as well as have all been delayed to July 15th. It also includes those who are self-employed and self-employment tax. So um, it's a significant kind of time value of money in terms of the tax deferral. Uh, a couple things that people may or may not know has happened in Ohio. Um, Ohio work has basically mandated from the governor's office that workers' comp premiums for March, April, and May could be deferred. And they've also um, put a lot of relief provisions into mandatory workers' comp education. So they're, depending on your business, you may be required to do all kinds of trainings and so forth. Most of those have been lifted temporarily um, while we work through the crisis. Um, the Ohio Department of Health has also mandated for health insurers to allow companies to defer premium payment for 60 days. So depending on how many employees you have that are covered, this could be a significant kind of benefit just in terms of current cash flow. Okay, the CARES Act. Um, it's a big piece of legislation, as I said earlier, uh, has a lot of different things in it. Um, the first is the unemployment benefits expansion. So the states will continue to pay the unemployment. States have different caps and different rates and different systems for unemployment. Uh, the federal government is covering the first week of unemployment for all of the states that have a one week waiting period, which is common. They've also extended, they're providing, the federal government is providing funding to the states to allow them to extend unemployment for an additional 13 weeks. And they're also providing funding to add $600 per week per a person claiming unemployment for four months. 
So these are major additions to the current unemployment system. Probably the most meaningful thing that they've done is they have made uh, unemployment available to people who are self-employed, which has never before happened. So all of those things are in process and all of them will be available retroactively. Unfortunately, many of the states do not have those provisions updated on their websites right now. So it's very confusing. If you're an employer who has unfortunately had to furlough people and send them to unemployment, um, what, what you're gonna see on those websites looks like the old system because that's all that's there right now. And it's gonna say there's a one week waiting period and that you have to demonstrate that you're looking for a job and all kinds of things like that. And none of that is actually true at this point. So there's just been an immense amount of frustration and confusion around unemployment. But these, these benefits are available and will be um, coming to people in retroactive fashion, as I said. Uh, next couple of things are tax benefits, retention credit. So you're able to get credit um, for keeping your employees against their security taxes. And is a thousand dollar employee credit. So that can be a very meaningful number. There's also an employer payroll tax payment deferral. Um, this is also a meaningful number. This is on the employee share of the social security tax that would otherwise be due uh, in 2020 with your normal kind of quarterly 941s. You can defer all of that uh, and pay 50% of it at the end of 2021 and 50% at the end of 2022. Um, that's a sizable number when you add that up. That's an automatic thing. If you're working with a payroll company, they have a, they basically are pushing a button that they have programmed that is making that happen. Um, if you need help thinking, thinking through that because you're doing your own payroll, again, we can answer questions for you on that. The net operating loss provisions is a significant change. Uh, this is one of those things that I mentioned early on, went away in the 2017 tax act. Uh, we used to be able to take net operating losses backwards against prior income. And then if you used them all up there or didn't use them up, you could carry them forward. Uh, in the 2017 Tax Act, we could only carry them forward. This is a um, short window of time that losses for 2018 through 2020 can go backwards five years, which will allow people to recoup some taxes paid in previous years and get some cash flow. Uh, they've also um, released the provision that was new that said you can only offset 80% of your um, prior income with net operating loss carrybacks and have restored it to a 100% carryback. So if you're in a situation where in 2020 you have a loss and that will be a lot of us, um, or if you had a loss in 19, you're able to go backwards now, which is something that we did not expect um, at the outset of this year. Excess business loss limitations, this is complicated. This is um, within the partnership space, primarily pass-through space, S-Corps. Um, there was a provision that was inserted in 2017 that basically said you could only deduct losses against other income up to certain thresholds. Um, that has been suspended temporarily. And if you're in a situation where you have a lot of pass-through income, you can see business losses. Uh, there's an amendment and tax refund opportunity here to go back and change that. So that would be something similar to the NOLs that there's an opportunity to, to get cash right now from that. Uh, the interest expense limitations, again, a 2017 change limited the amount of interest expense that businesses could deduct, uh, which was 30% of their earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization. That has been dropped uh, or has been increased, excuse me, the limitation has been dropped uh, so that you can deduct up to 50% of EBITDA uh, rather than 30%. And that's a big change, particularly for those that are in the real estate business and have a lot of interest expense uh, on mortgages. That would be something that's significant. You can also uh, look for your 2019 EBITDA in order to figure out how to take advantage of that in 2020, because in 2020, it's likely, as I said, that there will be some losses, but you'll be able to lift that limitation and be able to claim more losses. The qualified improvement property is a technical correction from 2017. Um, they got it wrong when they wrote it in the bill and they had not changed it yet. So they just did it as part of this bill, uh, which is tenant improvements to non-residential properties. So think about tenant improvements in lease space um, are eligible for a 15 year depreciable life and bonus depreciation. And that's significant because that is also something that you can amend for. 
So if you treated those tenant improvements in the last couple of years as real estate and were depreciating those over 39 years, you can go back and claim bonus depreciation on those and write them off all at once, which is an immediate cash opportunity. Uh, on the charitable contribution side, obviously uh, nonprofits are gonna be suffering in this kind of climate economically. So they have dropped the adjusted gross income limitation for 2020 for individuals. You typically could only deduct up to 50% of your taxable income in charitable deductions, depending on what your portfolio and your business income looks like. If you're a pass-through, uh, you may not have any AGI, but you'll still be able to, um, to deduct charitable contributions on your, on your tax return. Individual stimulus payments um, have gotten a lot of popular press. These are the payments that are being mailed directly to individuals who make under $75,000 um, that are just cash free and clear uh, from the government to try to cover those who need some cash flow while losing their jobs or perhaps taking pay cuts. Those checks have started to go out. Um, checks is kind of a relative number or phrase. Um, the Those who filed, electronically and who use direct deposit are getting their money first because the government's just going to use that same direct deposit information to put your check, your stimulus check into your account. Um, the, those who have filed their tax returns already, um, their stimulus checks will be based on 2019 income. If the 2019 returns are not filed because they're not due till July, then they'll base it on 2018. And all of that is in process right now. The first payments are supposed to be hitting mailboxes this week. Uh, retirement fund withdrawals, um, they've basically said that you don't, if you have to take money out of your retirement plan, your IRA, your 401k, whatever kind of deferred plan you're using, uh, they're typically, if you're taking that out before your retirement age, is going to be a 10% penalty on the earnings in that plan when you take that withdrawal out. Um, what's happening right now is you can take up to $100,000 as a hardship withdrawal, and you have three years to pay that back. So that's a replacement period that is significantly different than the law that we've had for a very long time. So you'll be able to spread, um, spread that out and pay it back. If you are retirement age and you're in that place where you're required to take minimum distributions annually, um, the required minimum distributions for 2020 have been suspended. So you are not required to take that income. You can leave that in your plan. And that will allow, if you don't need that income to live on right now, um, that will allow the hopefully the market to recover a little bit for your values to go back up. Uh, there's also a student loan exclusion. If employers make student loan payments of up to 5250, um, employer paid directly, those can be excluded from income and that's that's a change. So um, that's all the tax stuff as the highlights of the tax stuff. There are a lot of details there. Um, at this point, um, let's talk about the paycheck protection program loans. Um, and I think we should disclose right now, this was originally a $349 billion program. Um, more than two thirds of this money has been spoken for already. There is at this point, at least based on everything that I see, and I, I read multiple sources of news and watch multiple channels to try to see if I'm getting the truth. Um, what we're hearing right now is that there is bipartisan support for putting more money into this program because they're, the government overall feels like this program is working. It's getting money to businesses in need. Um, the basic premise of this program is that the government is going to make loans to people for them to continue to pay their payroll for eight weeks, which will allow people to stay employed. And I think this is really a, a this makes a lot of sense. Um, the idea of the government either having to pay people to be on unemployment or paying, paying businesses so that they can keep people working so that they don't claim unemployment uh, is, is pretty much common sense because we're still generating then the GDP from those businesses and avoiding some of the fallout that might happen. So that's the theory of it. Um, the way the program works is that a loan is approved based on two and a half times of your payroll, your average payroll. Um, we'll talk about how that's calculated. And after, at an eight week window, there's a measurement and at that point, uh, there are a number of calculations that relate to how many employees you still have employed and whether or not their salaries are the same as what they were before and how you've spent the money on either payroll or rent or utilities. Those are kind of the categories. And you're basically gonna certify what you did with the money and you're going to provide payroll records that show that you still have those people 
uh, on your payroll. And then there's a forgiveness piece that will happen. That forgiveness um, will be non-taxable. So this is really tr almost treated like a grant to uh, closely held businesses in order for them to be able to have the cash flow that they need to get through uh, this period. So um, there are, these do not require personal guarantees by business owners, which is unusual for the SBA. And um, there are some exceptions. So primarily they apply to businesses that have 500 or fewer employees. There are some exceptions um, specifically for restaurants and hotels. And this applies also to other kinds of franchises where um, if you have less than 500 employees per location, you can still qualify. Um, there's also an alternative size standard, which actually hits a lot of businesses in different uh, industries. So you need to think hard about this one. Um, you could have more than 500 employees, but if you have um, less than $15 million in net, that should say worth, um, or a two-year average net income after federal tax, less than $5 million, uh, you can still qualify for these loans. You're going to go to your bank for these loans, and most lenders right now are only working with clients who have existing accounts at their bank because they are overwhelmed. So I know here in the local market, Huntington Bank is the biggest SBA loan lender in central Ohio, and they have done more than a year's worth of loan applications in less than a week. So think about the processing that's happening is, is pretty incredible. Uh, we expect within the next week that this initial tranche of the $349 billion will have run out. We also do expect that there will be more money that comes into this program. So it's still definitely something worth talking about. So uh, you add up payroll, and payroll is exactly what you would think it is. It's your W-2s, right? It's salary, wages, commissions, but it's also uh, vacation pay, it's benefits, it's health care. It's retirement, it's payment of taxes that comes out of payroll payments. So there's, it's a fairly broad definition of what payroll is. Um, getting the payroll calculation correct is really important because that's the number then that you're gonna multiply times 2.5 to determine what your maximum loan is. Payroll does not include, and these are things that have been very confusing. These are some of the things that have been uh, clarified since the bill was or originally issued. Uh, compensation in excess of $100,000. So for those people on your payroll that make more than $100,000, you can count up to $100,000 per person. You can also still count their benefits and all of those other categories, but the comp itself has to be limited to $100,000. Um, employer taxes um, cannot be included, the employer portion of FICA, but the employee portion is. Um, people who do not live in the US cannot be included. Uh, the qualified sick leave that you might be paying based on the Families First Act that we talked about earlier, uh, you cannot count because you can't double dip on that. And then the most important thing, and, that, and it's important here because it changed midstream, payments to independent contractors. So anyone you pay on a 1099 instead of a W-2 uh, cannot be included. Those self-employed contractors, even if they kind of work for you frequently or regularly and are paid on a 1099, they are deemed to be self-employed and they can file for their own Paycheck Protection Act loan, but they cannot um, be included in the employer portion. So you determine the payroll and then submit to your bank through a loan application. Most of the banks are doing this electronically. And then the debt forgiveness um, it cannot exceed the principal amount of the loan that you're given. It's excluded from gross income, as I said. And it includes uh, expenditures for payroll, interest, rents, and utility payments. Um, the kicker here is that 75% of the loan amount has to be used for payroll. And then there's a reduction, as I said, if your headcount or your overall pay does decrease during that eight week period. Uh, if you rehire people by June 30 and make up for those wage reductions, um, then you can be in a place where all of it can be forgiven, even if you have already laid people off. So there's a fair amount of planning to do here around maximizing forgiveness and making sure that you're in a place that you are paying for the right things and managing this actively. Um, you're gonna then submit documentation on all of these categories to your lender to show them that you deserve to have the forgiveness. 
So you really need to develop a plan. This is another place where I've got some more details in here than what we'll talk about. You need a plan about who you're laying off, who you're bringing back, how much they make, what your averages are. You need, there's a lot of math to this. So we're suggesting to people that they get some advice and do this right um, kind of from the outset. If you're trying to re-engineer it on the back end when you're trying to apply for forgiveness, that's probably not gonna be a great result. So develop a plan, monitor your plan, and then make sure along the way that you're doing appropriate documentation. Uh, the more prepared you are, the more efficient you are, and the more loan forgiveness you'll be able to achieve. Um, the money right now, a lot of people are in this process and really frustrated because they don't know where they stand. So the process is basically that you apply. Uh, once you go into the SBA, you go into a queue where you get an SBA loan number. And at that point, there has been money allocated to you. The bank then has to gather all the documentation, submit it to the SBA. They have to create loan documents for you to sign, and then the, the money will flow from there. In some cases, that process has taken a matter of days. Um, more realistically, that process is taking several weeks at this point. So you have to just kind of take a deep breath and understand uh, where you are in the queue. If you are in the queue at the bank and you do not have an SBA loan number assigned to you, that's when you should be pressing on your banker because that SBA loan number is what's holding the reservation of the cash. Okay, um, I have a number of other things in here for your reference that I'm gonna let you just look at at your leisure, things around uh, cyber concerns because we've all moved to a remote environment. Um, cybersecurity is much more an issue right now in this kind of situation than normal. Um, so we've got some recommendations in there. We've also got some recommendations in here for cash flow forecasting and vendor management and just in general thinking about how to work with your bank uh, to help you get through this time. The banks are being pretty um, open to negotiation right now and to working with people to keep things flowing. So um, do consider those things and, and you can review those slides at your leisure. Um, update on pending legislation. As I said, we know that there is bipartisan support to do some more stimulus. Um, we think that that's gonna come in the form of more money in the Paycheck Protection Program. We also think that there's probably gonna be some modifications made to that so that some of the restaurant and hospitality businesses and others that have been shut down and are hurt the most uh, are able to take advantage of that because that, that program right now with bringing the people back in order to get the forgiveness, as I said earlier, is just really not working for certain segments of the economy. Uh, we're also expecting this going to be significantly more money probably pushed through the banking system uh, to make uh, low interest rate loans available. So we'll wait and see um, on both sides of the aisle as we would expect the Democrats and the Republicans are both trying to jam up some other things into these provisions and make this more complicated perhaps than it needs to be. So hopefully um, we'll be able to get through this and get something uh, with clarity, particularly around the, the PPP uh, within the next week or so. Uh, last here, just for fun, I found this online. Uh, 2020 is a unique leap year, 29 days in February, 300 days in March and five years in April. I know that's what we all feel like right now. Uh, we have tried, as I said at the outset, to try to see what kind of lessons we're learning right now along the way. And I've got some of those in here um, for you. And things are coming fast. And so I think what we've learned, we've done a lot of strategic planning over the last couple of years in our firm. And most of that is about the new things we're gonna do. We frankly have not had a plan for how we play defense when things fall apart. So I think one of the lessons we've learned is that we should probably always have a defensive plan rather than having to do it when we find out there's a pandemic. Uh, I think we've done that pretty well in the last uh, couple of days or months, but um, certainly something that we can all think about. Um, most businesses plan for what's next and what's big and what's the new idea as opposed to what happens if everything shifts under my feet. Uh, next thing is just regular communication to our team. We have um, tried to be as honest and as straightforward as we can and as timely as we can with our team to try to keep everybody on the same page. Because we're in a client service business, we really need to be in touch with our customers constantly and telling them what's going on. And what we have learned along the way, which probably is common sense, is that when we tell people uh, one thing at a time, one email, one topic, 
they listen and they absorb pretty well. When we try to give them a whole laundry list of things that they need to know, uh, the absorption is significantly less. So uh, what we're learning is that we are trying to figure out how to be brutally honest, probably more so than normal, about the condition of our business and uh, allowing therefore some trust to build so that we can work better together through this. Uh, we've learned that we thought we were paperless and we really weren't. So um, now we are because we're all working at home. And I think that that is going to um, give us some things that we take back to us when we do go back to the office that we will never return to again. So thinking about processes, thinking about the way that we do things, um, there's, a, there's a lot to be gathered I think for all of us that have had to shift the way we're working, uh, some of the things we're doing now are better than the things we were doing before and we need to remember that. Uh, the importance of high quality IT, I just keep calling them superheroes, right? There are frontline healthcare workers, really, uh, in our business. We, we could not work from home and be safe if we did not have the IT infrastructure that we have. And so as we have looked at cost cutting on entertainment and all kinds of other things, um, we have not considered one dollar of reduction to our IT systems and our IT budget. And I think that probably a lot of businesses are in that same place. Uh, we found that we can move really fast when we have to. And what we have figured out with all of this legislation in particular is that we had to divide and conquer. We always have done that that way where we have a couple of point persons on uh, new legislation. But what we have not always done is told other people to just keep doing what they're doing and we'll let the experts take care of it. We've done that temporarily right now. That requires that we all trust one another and that we can go to the experts and say, here's my client who's completely stressed out and upset and I'm gonna trust that you can actually answer their questions and I don't have to know it myself. And that's that's a big thing for us. I, you know, Certainly everybody else is gonna catch up on all these rules, but I think what we're learning is that um, we can have a trust amongst one another to provide the service that needs to be provided um, that will create a different kind of teamwork for us in the future. We're also figuring out how to engage with people. So um, I told the, the people on the call here that before we, we hit the live button that we have engaged with more than 2,500 people in the last month via webinar. And we have done very few webinars in our history prior to this. So what we're finding is that there is a social community out there. You just have to find a different place to have it. We typically have a lot of events and gather people together in person. And we've had to do something very different than that. And it seems to be working. Uh, lastly, uh, compassion and empathy are just as important as knowledge. And so in a lot of cases, um, we, we know that being a business owner is lonely and maybe you just need to talk about what's going on with somebody who might understand it. Um, we all need to find that. I think we're learning from that, particularly our younger team members who have not lived through a recession are learning a lot about empathy and how to improve their emotional IQ skills, uh, which are invaluable, obviously, for all of us in all aspects of our lives. So um, those are probably pretty basic things, but I expect that the list of lessons learned will get much, much longer before this is over. And this quote is one that we shared with our team this week, smooth seas do not make skillful sailors. So we are all learning right now um, how to be good sailors on rough waters. We know that you are too. And the last thing I would offer to you is that if there are resources that you need that are not accounting, but are somehow related to your business, we are welcoming those calls as well, where we can probably point you in the right direction or give you three or four names of people that can do that for you and just save you some time. So I will stop at this point and I think we'll take some questions. Great, I do see one question has already come in, Darcy. Uh, for you, of course, and it's does a PPP include guaranteed payment for the owner of the LCC? It does, and that was just clarified yesterday. Um, so there was some confusion if you were getting guaranteed payments as a partner as to whether or not you were an employee that would be in the payroll calculation or whether you were technically self-employed because people who get guaranteed payments and partnerships pay self-employment tax. Um, there was some advice out there that perhaps the owners of businesses who are receiving guaranteed payments needed to apply for their loans on, the, on their own as um, self-employed people. And that the SBA clarified that that is not accurate. So yes, you would include the guaranteed payments uh, in the calculation of the, the overall payroll up to the $100,000 cap. Okay, great. And then I just wanted to highlight real quick for a minute. I know we had to move quickly through the um, second portion of the slides, but you had a segment on the cash flow and negotiating yeah. with your bank. 
I know you have materials on the GBQ website as well. And I, from my client's perspective, that is critical. They've applied for the PPP, they've uh, assessed their current situation and they're in the planning mode. That planning mode and considerations of cash moving forward is so essential. So I know we don't have a lot of time, but I, I also know that you have a ton of resources on your website. Yes. Um, can you just talk for a minute about the significance and importance of that cash planning and some of the resources available? Yeah, so what we're seeing a number of things, right? First of all, um, we're operating differently, most of our businesses. And so there are things that are discretionary spending that we can just stop doing. Uh, we also, most of us have some trusted vendors that we can probably work out terms with. Um, depending on those biggest cash line items, we're recommending that you start with those vendors. And you know, most vendors are willing to say, as long as we're gonna get paid, right? That we're, we're willing to work with you on what that timeline looks like. So there's a lot of cash that can be freed up that way. Uh, what we're hearing from almost all of the banks here in our local market is that they are willing to renegotiate terms. They're willing to waive bank covenants um, temporarily, and they're willing uh, in some cases to actually put more money into your line of credit or into your existing loans um, with relatively little hassle to try to help you um, kind of stabilize your business. So I think there are a lot of options there. Probably the best resource for that on the GBQ website is the checklist that we've created. And it's a checklist that includes all kinds of business issues, but it has a specific section on cash flow and financing um, that, that really helps you kind of think through some of those variables. Yeah, thank you. I've shared that with a lot of my clients. I think that's an essential tool. Um, okay, well, do, if we have any other questions, please just go ahead and submit them. I'm happy to you know, ask Darcy and, you, this is our opportunity to benefit from her knowledge and experience. So please go right ahead. Um, in the meantime, um, Rick, jump in if you have any questions, but I know we have some here. Um, tell me a little bit, Darcy, about how you, um, I know you're communicating regularly with both your team and your clients and your team is communicating with your clients. A lot of that must be done via Zoom or, or conference call. And we, we've talked a little bit about building trust in this environment. So have you successfully been able to build and restore trust using Zoom or conference calls or, or are there techniques that you've found that make it easier to do? Because this is a hard thing to build trust via, a, a, you know. It is, and, and we, we are fortunate that most of the people we're communicating with, we already know. Um, so, you know, we have client relationships and in a lot of cases is long-standing client relationships, the easy part, right? When you already have some trust that's built. Um, but we're working with a lot of business owners who are facing issues that they have never faced before and who are really unnerved by the situation, understandably. Um, that causes people to get, you know, really impatient to kind of lose their temper sometimes to be very skeptical as to the advice they're being given. Um, so there's, we're, we're communicating a lot with our team about some of those kind of human behaviors so that people are not surprised. And I mentioned earlier, you know, we have a lot of young people in our business, um, probably most of us do. Um, I calculated um, based on our headcount right now and based on how long people have been in the workforce it's just under 60% of our workforce that has never worked during a recessionary time. So a big piece of what we're communicating internally is what kind of stress is happening, right? What kind of decisions are being made on that side? And how do we as quickly as possible make sure that we have the right people on the phone call or on the Zoom? So this is not a time to kind of wing it and think that you can give somebody advice because your advice literally may be you know, somebody's livelihood. So I think, we're taking things very seriously. We're also trying to make sure that we approach every conversation from the perspective first of how are you? You know, not just how's your business and what's your problem, but how are you? How's your team? How's your family? Is everybody healthy? Is everybody safe? And that seems to be, you know, adding a lot uh, to those conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we covered so much about the CARES Act. And I know a lot of, um, the smaller businesses under 500 employees or 15 million, I think you said in annual revenues, they, they have moved forward and applied for the PPP. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of them are kind of scrambling, making sense of everything you've just covered. Yeah. What is the next step? Once someone has done the PPP, should they sit down with someone, maybe either at GBQ or the like, to sort of say, okay, this is what I've done. This is where I'm at. I mean, it, there's so much to cover and so much you can miss. How does a business owner make sure that they've taken advantage of everything? Yeah, so you know that kind of probably depends on what your internal accounting team looks like because this is all math and calculation. Um, if you've got a strong team, we're, we have a lot of clients who have gone through this entire process by themselves and they've pinged us with a couple questions and their calculations and understand uh, what the rules say. In other cases, you may not have that bandwidth or you may have your controller or your CFO completely focused on something else related to saving your business and they simply don't have time. Uh, so we, do, we did do yesterday um, an entire session on just the forgiveness portion of the PPP. That um, recording is live on our website. So if you wanna start there for basic education, it's, there's also a lot of mathematical examples in that slideshow that would help you understand kind of how the math works as a starting point and maybe help you at least be able to pull together all of the relevant information so that when you do sit down with an advisor, um, you've got all the, all the details and you can kind of minimize the time and angst in that meeting uh, by being prepared. So um, I, would, I, I would suggest you start there. There's, there are multiple PPP resources on our website, but that one that is about specifically debt forgiveness is probably the right place for those people that are already in the process. Okay. We had one comment come in here. I want to make sure we have time to address it. Uh, we have one attendee he's, who's in the grocery food business and business has surged, but the issue is cash flow as they right. increase production so dramatically yes. and so quickly. Any thoughts? on the best direction for a quick short-term loan, private investor versus bank to help with the working capital. The PPP will not be enough. Yeah, um, I, would go, I would go to the existing banking relationship. Um, I think that the banks are understanding these unique situations and um, what we're seeing, and I, I have not worked with somebody in the grocery business yet, but what we have seen with clients who are uh, changing their production from helping with those things have been able to obtain some additional financing in order to help them keep going. Because it, you know, if you're going to change your business and it's going to explode in any way, the cash flow is going to lag behind that. And I'm certain that's what's happening in the grocery business. So I would definitely start there. I think you're going to find that most lenders are pretty open to being accommodating at this time. And your banker will most likely have partners that they can refer you to. Yes. If there are yes. other alternatives. Yeah. Okay. I think we need to wrap it up here, but Darcy, if I could ask you one last question. Sure. Let me turn it back over to Rick. You mentioned your media sources. Are there two that you definitely go to every day and which are those? I may have lost you there. Oh yeah, I lost you there for a minute. Oh, good. Go, go again. I'm wondering what your two favorite media sources are. I usually go to the Wall Street <laughs> Journal and the New York Times. I'm curious about you. Uh, I, I look at CNBC's uh, homepage about 10 times a day. Um, they seem to be able to give me the, the concise headlines in the business space. Um, and then I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the New York Times regularly too. Um, also reading several um, commentators, blogs, and people that are kind of following some of the stuff that's happening in D.C., um, but hit, hitting a lot more news sites than normal, certainly. Yeah, and I think before we pass it over to Rick, Darcy, could you just provide your contact information? Sure. So can follow up with sure. You? Sure, there you go, um, and you can, you can easily find me at gbq.com, and I am happy to take questions from anybody who participated. I'm also happy to connect you with our subject matter experts on any of these kind of detailed and nuanced issues. Okay, thank you so much, Darcy. Sure. And Rick, off to you to close us out. Darcy, we can't thank you enough for uh, all of this information you've provided. 
And I feel like I've been drinking from a water hose for the past 45 minutes. And, and I, I also thank you that uh, GBQ has put up so many useful resources at uh, gbq.com slash coronavirus. Uh, phenomenal resources for business owners, non-client, clients alike. And uh, I think from a community perspective, I just need to say thank you for that. Um, Thanks. I, I want to thank all of our uh, attendees, whether you're with us on Zoom or on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. And for those of you that asked questions, thank you, because that made our discussion richer. And uh, I also want to say, watch your inbox for a message regarding the replay opportunity for this. We're going to have it cataloged on YouTube. And then also, um, we're going to be announcing our next session. We have a number of sessions lined up. And we're working with the presenters and panels to get those scheduled. And as soon as we have that, we'll, uh, we'll let you know what that is via email. The next one most likely is next Wednesday. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that. The one um, either could be next or right after that one will be next Friday at, I believe, 11 a.m. or the noon hour. But watch your email and we'll keep you updated on that. And what I would like to do right as we close is that I would, I, in addition to thanking everybody who's here, it's one parting thought in the overriding question that we have been asking as part of this series is we need to be asking ourselves, what does this make possible? Uh, because even though it's really hard right now, we have tremendous opportunities before us to make a difference and make a positive difference you know, on a variety of fronts. And so I just want to leave everybody with the simple question today of what does this make possible? Thank you for joining us.